Hello, and welcome to the UCLA Biomedical Physics Graduate Program website. My name is Mike McDick Ray, and I'm the director of the graduate program. Biomedical physics is fundamentally an interdisciplinary program, and both our research and curriculum revolve around the interactions between biology and physics. So we are interested in applicants from all scientific backgrounds, including biology, biophysics, physics, chemistry, engineering, just about any kind, mathematics, computer science, and so on. We are part of the graduate program in biosciences at UCLA, and we're both an NIH-supported training program and a CAMPEP accredited graduate program in medical physics. To tell you more about our program, we're developing a series of short videos by our students, both current and past, to explain some of the fundamental ideas of their research. We hope you find these interesting and informative, and if you are interested in applying to our graduate program, please visit our website at www.bmp.ucla.edu for more information. Our contact information is there as well. Thank you. Hi, I excited to talk to you a little bit today about uh, the work that I've been doing in the biomedical physics track through the Division of Molecular and Cellular Oncology. This encompasses uh, radiation biology. So who am I? Uh, my name is Nathan Martin, and I recently graduated from the program uh, in radiation biology. But I actually started out in, as a physics undergrad uh, doing space science type of research. Uh, but I came to UCLA uh, to do the biomedical physics program uh, to get involved more with kind of the medical applications of physics. I became really interested in radiation biology and, and now I've become a molecular biologist. So why did I make this transition to radiation biology uh, when I was more of a physicist to begin with? Well, I always thought it was funny in uh, my physics undergrad where everyday objects uh, like you and me or animals were always approximated as a sphere in, in you know magical physics world uh, where there was no friction and, and everything was, was fine. Now what was interesting uh, when I started to learn a little bit about radiotherapy and, and the treatment plans, it turns out the treatment plans are designed uh, or customized basically off of patient geometry. Uh, so there's a patient with some tumor that has some shape in a part of the body, and the treatment plan's really designed and optimized based off of geometry. It turns out from a biology perspective, uh, averages for how people's tissue uh, across large populations are used um, instead of any kind of patient-specific uh, biology response. So I was really interested in whether or not I could learn a little bit about how uh, patients react to radiotherapy from a biology standpoint and whether or not I could start to get towards uh, treatment planning that was based uh, not just on geometry but really about patient-specific biology as well. So this is what really got me into uh, radiobiology, and as I started to dig around a little bit, I found out, at least for ionizing radiation, which is a type of radiation that you see in CT scans or x-rays or radiotherapy, it turns out that DNA is really important. And specifically looking at DNA double strand breaks. And so when cells are radiated, uh, whether in, in a culture dish or, or as part of a radiotherapy plan, uh, DNA is broken, uh, creating a double strand break, so both sides of the DNA are broken open. It was actually very complex and well orchestrated uh, repair mechanisms that are activated to handle this damage. Now when these work well, uh, the cells can survive, the integrity of the genome is maintained, uh, but if there's any problem with these repair mechanisms, it's actually very toxic for the cells. Now this is good for tumor tissue, uh, we want to damage the DNA and, and make it so the tumor tissue can't survive, uh, but we don't want the healthy tissue to die as well. And that's really the crux of radiation biology, is understanding how to leave normal tissue alone, uh, but really target the tumor tissue with radiation. So as I started looking around at uh, labs in the program, uh, looking for something that, that might study this uh, reaction to radiation f in terms of DNA repair, I settled on the Gatti lab. Uh, so this lab studies human radiosensitivity disorders, which is really the, the genetic basis for uh, sensitivity to radiation. So like I said, we study rare genetic disorders uh, that result in patients who have a high risk for cancer uh, because they have unstable genomes. And it turns out that these patients are highly sensitive to radiation because they don't repair their DNA adequately. Uh, so sensitive, in fact, that low doses of radiation can actually be lethal for them. And one of the main patient populations that we've studied uh, over the last few decades has been a disorder called ataxia telangiectasia. 
It's always a tongue twister, and so we call it AT for short. And it turns out this disorder uh, involves a neurologic condition or neurodegeneration in the cerebellum. But also, the, these patients don't recognize DNA damage or repair it adequately, and, and that's where the sensitivity to radiation comes from. And so we do some clinical testing to identify these patients and other patients with known radiosensitive disorders. But along the way, we pick up a lot of patients who are radiosensitive or their, their cells are radiosensitive, uh, but we don't know why. We don't know the genetic basis for it. And that's where I come in on, on kind of the research component of our lab. And we're interested in studying these, these unknown radiosensitive cases to identify new mechanisms of sensitivity. So these patients are really windows into how our cells and, and really how we uh, react to radiation. So we're always interested in discovering new radiosensitive disorders because they represent uh, new ways that we can understand how our cells and how we respond to radiation. And one of the studies that I've done that I'm going to tell you a little bit about involves a gene called MTPAP. So we identified this gene as being possibly radiosensitizing uh, for cells by doing uh, what's called exome sequencing. Uh, so we looked through a number of patients with this exome sequencing technique. And what it looks for are mutations in the coding regions of genes, or the parts of genes that go on to code for proteins. So through this, uh, like I said, we found a mutation in MTPAP. It was a homozygous mutation, uh, meaning it was the same mutation on both arms, uh, both copies of the gene. And two Amish patients that we were studying, they're actually siblings. Now it turned out these patients were radiosensitive, uh, which I'll show some data for here. Um, so what we see here is uh, our assay to look for radiosensitivity is a clonogenic survival assay. Uh, this is an experiment or assay that uh, we irradiate the cells um, and then we wait about five generations for them to grow to see which ones survive long enough to become what's called clonal, or able to divide over, over five generations. So with wild-type cells, when we expose them to one gray of ionizing radiation, we see about half the cells survive. Whereas with an AT patient, which is the, our, our known radiosensitive disorder, uh, we see only about 10% of the cells uh, can go on to be clonogenic. And the two patients that I was studying with this MTPAP mutation, RS63-3 and dash 7, I see a similar response to the radiation as we see in AT patients, uh, meaning that they're radiosensitive. Now, in the rest, the siblings in the rest of the family, uh, I found that there was normal uh, response to radiation, and these are the patients that don't have two bad copies of this MTPAP gene. So I had a pretty strong association between MTPAP and the radiosensitivity that we see in the two patients. But this was just an association. And so what I needed to do was show that this gene, MTPAP, was actually causing the radiosensitivity that I was seeing. So what we can do is actually add back a normal copy of the gene, or a wild type copy of the gene. So when I did that in these patients, again, with just the control gene that we can add in, or an empty gene, uh, I found that, again, these patients are very sensitive to radiation, uh, similar to our known radiosensitive disorder. But when I add back a wild-type copy of the gene in both patients, the survival increases and actually increases up to normal levels of radiosensitivity or normal survival after radiation. And this really proved it for us that the MTPAP gene was the reason that these patients were, or the, the reason the patient cells were radiosensitive. This was pretty interesting, and we actually learned quite a bit from these patients. It turns out that these patients, uh, it seems anyways, have an atypical presentation of radiosensitivity. It seems that their mitochondria are very important for how they respond to radiation. And in other known radiosensitive disorders, this hasn't been the case. It's really been purely a DNA repair or DNA damage recognizing defect. And it turns out in these patients that it looks like the mitochondria are pretty important um, and the antioxidant response is very important. So this gave us really a kind of a new look into um, other mechanisms that might sensitize patients or patient cells to radiation and gives us a new avenue to study uh, for this radiosensitivity. It was also interesting because I was able to treat uh, these patient cells with antioxidants and it turned out to actually improve their survival and improve their response to this DNA damage. 
uh, which was pretty exciting because antioxidants are, are very prevalent and there's many uh, different antioxidants that are approved for human use. Um, and so it sounds like the antioxidants would actually be a pretty good idea for these patients, at least to help them uh, respond to uh, DNA damage that incurs during the day better. So thanks for listening. Uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about the biomedical physics program, uh, you can see the BMP site, uh, ecla.edu. If you're interested in kind of the complete story about this MTPAP gene, uh, you can find it in the journal Cell Death and Disease, uh, which should be published uh, shortly. And if you're interested in reading more generally about radiosensitivity, uh, search for my mentor and, and boss, uh, R.A. Gaddy, in PubMed, and that'll take you to the, the number of papers from our lab on radiosensitivity. So with that, thank you.